another living history of Bronxville. Each year we pick a different theme and as you may know from watching it this year we're interviewing writers and artists and as you may have noticed tonight we have an entirely different look. We are in the studio of one of our local artists, a person who has lived here 32 years in Bronxville, Randy Frost. Randy we're delighted to have you here. Well, Welcome to my studio. <laughs> And as you may have guessed by now in looking at the set here, which is not a set, it's, it's just the way Randy lives every day in her beautiful studio, uh, Randy is into quilt making. Randy, we, we usually begin by just getting a little background on you, and uh, just tell us a little bit, wh where were you born, where did you grow up? I was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and lived in Hillside, which was the next town uh, all my life until I got married at the age of 21. And, and that was shortly after graduation from Rhode Island School of Design. Mm -hmm. Now, you were telling me something early, that earlier, you grew up in a family where everybody liked to sew. That is, uh, all of the people on my uh, parental level, uh -huh. um, none of my cousins did. <laughs> my mother was a knitter, she taught knitting. Uh, her sister sewed and made most of our clothes. And uh, my father's sister-in-law did a lot of embroidery. So wherever I went with the family or visited family members, somebody was, was working with a needle. So as the day follows the night, I mean, this is almost an inevitable uh, 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 thing that you did. And yet you were in painting, as we'll learn in just a second. You were a painter for a long time before you began this. For quite some yeah. number of years. Now let's double back a little bit and to your, to your education. Where did you get your, um, your uh, BA? Where did you... Um, I got my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Graphic Design at Rhode Island School of Design. Some of you may not know the Rhode Island School of Design, but it is certainly one of the very tops in the United States. For and it's usually known as RISD, and even that <laughs> name is recognized these days. Uh, RISD, I didn't even learn it uh, the other yeah. way. Mm -hmm. And your husband, Corky, some of you may know Corky Frost, who, uh, among other things, is what, the current chairman of the of planning committee? Planning board. Board in, mm -hmm. the, in the village. Uh, Corky designed this, or you and Corky designed it together? This uh, He and I designed one... it, and we had the help of an architect friend of his uh, mm -hmm. to do some of the drawings. But Corky's an architect, too. Yes. So this mm -hmm. uh, was a labor of love uh, for all of you for a little while. It was for mm -hmm. better part of 1983. Right. So uh, you went to RISD, uh, and, um, and then you began to study painting. I studied, began studying painting several years after I graduated, in fact, when I moved here. And who did you study, I mean, how did you go about studying it? Um, I had not enjoyed painting in uh, art school because people majoring in graphic design weren't um, encouraged to do much painting. Mm -hmm. But um, there were some very good classes being taught here when I moved here, and the teacher was Barbara Pato. And, uh, there are people still living in the village who study with her, maybe as a child, maybe as an adult. Was but, this over at the uh, women's club? Did she teach? No, her? no, she, she taught in um, a garage. <laughs> That's the life of an artist, is there? That's right. Uh, in a garage. Um, well, uh, you you know continued to uh, take lessons and. Uh, but you worked, at the beginning you were in commercial art, right, in New York City? When, when I uh, got out of art school, I worked for a commercial art studio in the city, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it was a little too soon for women at that yeah. point. Women were not treated very well in that field. In that field. Yeah. And um, have you ever been back into commercial art? You really moved out of that. Then, I right? moved out of it as a, 
you know, means of earning an income, but I've always done bits and pieces of it as a volunteer, mm -hmm. and certainly for my own purposes. It's, it's a very useful tool. Yeah. Uh, you have a little, just a little piece of uh, work of art that you could show us. Can you just pick that up this for a second? An, this is an See example of a... Peter of, North, our cameraman, can get this. Uh, um, this is an example of um, a painting that I did, um, oh, maybe 20 years ago. And this was toward the end of the time that I was painting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and getting more into collage mm -hmm. and quilt making. Now, why I find this so intriguing is that you could, it's just one step from what you were doing there to what you're doing here. I exactly. Mean, you could see yeah. the evolution uh, mm -hmm. very clearly. Um, well, I guess I should ask the all important question. I mean, why, what made you go from painting to quilting? Um, I really hit the equivalent of a creative block. Uh -huh. And you, know, you hear about writer's blocks. Well, all creative people have the same kind of problem. It just has a different name. And what I did, because I had been told by my painting teacher that it was a good way of keeping your engines going, was to start working on paper collage and, and drawing. And those things help sustain you when you can't paint. Mm -hmm. So I became more and more involved in paper collage. And about that time, I interviewed a young woman um, for a, a, a needle arts magazine um, who was doing quilting, quilting. And she had the most wonderful studio, and she was doing what I really wanted to be doing, mm -hmm. which was literally doing collage with fabric. And I made the rest every is the rest <laughs> is history. I made every effort to take workshops with any people I could possibly could uh -huh. take workshops with, and. A lot of preparation. You mentioned, though, a very important exhibit at the Whitney Museum. Uh, it, was, it was a telling exhibit for a lot of people. When was it? What 1974. Uh -huh. And it was... 74, uh, uh, that's, that's 23 years It was years the first ago. time that quilts had been shown in a major art museum in New York, or anywhere for that matter. Mm -hmm. And a young man by the name of Jonathan Holstein had been collecting Amish quilts because he loved their geometric quality and colors. And he found that they bore a very strong relationship to the art of that time, which is basically op art and clean color field painting. And when he hung them there, other people got the same message. And people began to realize that what the Amish were doing 100 years earlier was very serious art. Mm -hmm. And that is true. I think um, you go in around the Amish country. I mean, you can buy these beautiful things, and they're just very off art. Um, well, so you've been uh, just developing this. I mean, how much time? Uh, Peter's going to do a sweep now of your studio and, and just show this wonderful circular studio. Um, and as you take a look at it, I mean, you can see the windows. You need the lighting for your... Um... Actually, there's a curious thing about lighting. Uh, you have to be very careful with light, with fabric, because sunlight is very damaging mm -hmm. to fabric. Mm -hmm. So the light is nice to work by, but I have to be very careful to cover up the fabrics, and you will see that, that I, have... I have worked out a way to keep them covered when I'm not using them, mm -hmm. but when I'm working, I can quickly uncover them. And, and then, then cover you put them it up. back in. Yeah. And I hope uh, you see this... Uh, mm -hmm. this um, Sweep yeah. of, uh, Peter's going to do a little sweep of also all the thread that you see there. And you can see some of the fabric hanging out now from the, um, those and are I, uncovered. I, I'll, uh, I'll take off one of, one of these covers. Okay. Uh, they're, they're just on Velcro and they come off very easily. easily. So, so you've uh, got this all worked out. Yes. Yes, for anybody who's had wonderful fabric that they love, uh, I have a couple of sofas that I wish I could um, have protected and... Uh, it is amazing what the sun does to it. Anyway, so, um, you know, one of the first things you did um, after you really became committed to this was to start planning this, this studio that makes it such a wonderful place to be. Yeah, it, it, it happened at an interesting time. The um, owners of the studio that I was in next door uh, were selling the house, and the new owners really wanted to use the space for themselves. And just about that time, I realized I was going to stop painting and that if I was not going to be painting myself, I shouldn't be teaching children either. I believe in You were teaching children at the time, Yes, too? in the same studio. Right. And I believe in practicing what you preach. Yeah. And, and if, you're, if you're not doing that, then you have to cease mm -hmm. and desist. 
So everything came together very nicely at that time. And now you're teaching quilting in addition to making quilts, in addition I'm to doing, writing about it. Yeah, I'm not doing it in my studio, but yeah. I'm doing it through the Westchester Arts Council in uh, two different programs. One is their regular schools program, and the other is in the Arts Excel program, mm -hmm. which works with very difficult school districts in inner cities, and uh, on the theory that a lot of things are learned through art, and sometimes it's the only way to reach children who haven't been able to understand what is happening mm -hmm. in the classroom. I would think quilting could be a wonderful it is. release for them. It is absolutely wonderful. Okay, here's the, this is why we came to the studio, this next question, and that is, Randy, tell us how you make a quilt. I mean, I have seen many quilts, but uh, until recently and now, I have never appreciated what goes into it. So why don't you just sort of um, get up and, and just sort of start from the beginning. I'm going to get off camera here so that you have enough um, room to to sort of do this. I may well, ask a few before questions. Before you do that, let me just say that um, be before I be was working in right. the, what the manner you see here, I learned traditional quilt making, what assembling is quilts by mm. blocks, by squares, mm -hmm. in a grid. That it was the traditional way you of doing it. You laid it out things. on the floor and you got the grid, or how do you... You uh, laid it out on whatever surface you had available right, to you, right. if it was the dining room table or a work table or uh -huh. whatever. I was fortunate enough to have this nice working wall, which mm -hmm. uh, I could, so I could pin everything to it. But after a while, I began to see that grid constantly, and I wanted an overall picture because I wanted my quilts to have the imagery that I had in painting, mm -hmm. and that is looking at the entire surface instead of looking at a series of squares. You know, with right. these lines, you could always see the lines horizontally and, and mm -hmm. vertically, and it was uh, very distracting. Yeah. And I wanted to find a way to work that could take those lines away, mm -hmm. that those seams would not be evident. That you, know, that, you wanted the freedom to do yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Well, so you're sort of like Picasso, pardon the analogy, but <laughs> I mean, he started out and showed that he could do regular painting, and then he went from there, of course, into a far uh, more uh, abstract form. And, and actually, although yours isn't, I wouldn't refer to it as abstract in a way, but it's certainly far it more free It is to uh, a, a fair yeah. degree because my painting was abstract. Yeah. Um, but the imagery in the traditional quilt making was also very abstract, mm -hmm. and that was the very point that Jonathan Holstein was making in his show at the Whitney yeah, at Museum, the Whitney, that there was, uh, there was abstract art to be seen mm -hmm. in the quilts yeah. of the 19th century. That's amazing. Well, let okay. me get out of the scene now, and I'm going to just let you sort of take us from the beginning. I, I'll start off with the first question, and that is, you know, how do you, how do you get an idea? I mean, how do you... Uh, sort of get yourself started on a new project? What's the, what's the first step? Well, there, there are several ways. Um, one is to um, just find some fabrics, and very often a piece of fabric will speak to me and I will want to build around it, and the imagery will come right out of one piece of fabric. Mm -hmm. And one of the um, uh, quilts that we photographed over at Concordia College, and I know that we'll be showing those at some point, um, came from just that. Mm -hmm. um, this piece right over here came from a group of black and white photographs, or not photographs, but fabrics that I'd always wanted to work with. And the, just the right moment hit, and I started to assemble them, and mm -hmm. it all fell together. But it, you know, it, these things don't always happen Easily. like that. <laughs> you, right. you have to, you have to uh, think about it for a while. So and, you were saying you started out sometimes <coughs> in paper. Yes. And made, okay, and you've got an example of that, right? Yeah. Um, what this is, this to is, the, 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 there's one here, there's one there, and there's one right here. Okay. Uh, this one is a completed quilt, so it's probably easier to see. This is a very rough collage. It wasn't done as a finished piece. Yeah, these are actually pages torn from magazines, torn and cut and shaped and... Do you clip a lot of magazines? Do you have? I keep a, a, a big folder full of, of clippings when I see a really wonderful picture that might someday turn into something. I'll mm -hmm. just file it away. But this is just at the groundwork. Yeah. This, at, at a certain point, I turn this around and I don't look at it anymore. You don't even look at it? But once yeah. I've gotten the basic stuff 
in there, yeah. then I don't want this to dictate the outcome because you can't facially reproduce something that has been photographed. Right. You have to let the fabric take over. Right. And, and it does. And then you can okay. start to embellish and add these buttons. Okay, now, you, so you get it in, in paper. Now, you were telling me you start to tack it to the wall, in other words. I mean, that's completed. What, this is all sewn step? together. Yeah. Now, Over here is a work in progress. Uh -huh. And this piece and has that's a pinned onto the uh, uh, what do you call that a poster board? This is um, this is a, a kind of a construction board that's quite soft. You can put a pin in it pretty easily and hold something together, and not kill your fingertips in the process. Uh, this is homo soap. Mm -hmm. um, what I do when I have a collage that looks like this? That's the. Uh, this is the collage for this for piece. This. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the uh, paper. Okay. I will assemble all the fabrics I have that might work and mm -hmm. there are many more fabrics assembled than get used. I might have a pile that high. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll, by trial and error, I will pin up some of the fabrics, usually in large pieces. And then as I eliminate the non-candidates, um, I start to cut a few shapes and put them up. In this case, I put the black fabric up as a whole piece and I started to then superimpose these pieces on top of it. But it wouldn't have to be. Sometimes you just, you don't even have a, a basic background one. You just, that's uh, right. So every little piece. Certainly you know. that was true in this case. For um, the, um, there were just a lot one. of chunks that I put up on the wall and then eventually refined. Mm -hmm. Where do, you, where do you get your idea for it? I mean, this is just amazing what you've done there. It all. came from this. Yeah. I can and this, it. in turn, came from magazine pages, catalog pages. Mm -hmm. And I just saw images that I liked and started to move them around at my drawing table mm -hmm. and started to, and then pasted them down. Now, you were starting to show us earlier before we started taping how you cut these fabrics. Can you just show us how? That's your little... Um, this, is, this is a small version of my work table. Yes, you have um, a huge one. I mean, uh, such luxury, yeah. This is a self-healing mat, and when we need a straight edge, uh, it's, it's a very nice tool because it's all marked out on a grid, and this is when a grid is very helpful, so that uh, you can use a see-through ruler like this this is another one that has inches marked on it and mm -hmm. 45 degree angles and so forth. Now you take the paint, you take you have a piece of cloth there that you can just show us. I'm going to show you how to cut one of these. This is my um, razor blade pizza cutter. <laughs> and uh, say I want a strip like this. Right. I can um, get, if I want it half an inch, quarter of an inch, uh, whatever width um, is required. I can put a piece of fabric like this down, align it with the um, grid of the self-healing mat, and then select, um, well, quarter inch, maybe I'll cut off a, a one inch piece because I'll need a um, seam allowance of a quarter of an inch. This has a safety on it, by the way. Um, very it's important. Necessary. This, this is a indeed a, it's a razor blade, yeah. and um, it's got a couple of nicks in it, so I may not even get a clean cut right now because mm -hmm. it's been used quite a bit. Do a second cut just to be sure. And you have and a nice have clean it. piece. Maybe this is very helpful when you want to do something like strip piecing, um, which you can see in this piece here, there are a whole lot of parallel pieces. And if you, if you need to cut some maroon, some pink, some tan, then you can cut them all apart and seam them together and make up uh -huh. a whole new piece of fabric right. out of now strips. The, now the next step for you though, now you've cut your strips and you've, you know the way you want it, the next step is to the sewing machine, right? Yes. And uh, we're going to get a little uh, run here of you working at your sewing machine, um, you must do a lot of sewing, right? I mean, it really... The machine is very important. There is some hand sewing, too. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain things that a sewing machine just doesn't do, or you don't have the right feel for right. it. Uh, some people won't work with their hands at all. It's called the H word. We don't do things with our hands. I happen to like working with my hands. Yeah. Well, you were saying you use different techniques. You not only use a sewing machine, but 
a lot of yours have applique on it, right? Yeah, and some of it is machine applique where I've just cut a raw edge mm -hmm. and then done a stitch around it. On this particular piece, I've um, raw edged everything down so you see some frayed fabric. Ultimately, I will probably either do a satin stitch on the machine, which is like a zigzag, or um, I think over here you'll see, um, excuse me, I've taken some cording and covered up the raw edge so that it doesn't fray too much because these things get handled a lot once right. they're finished and they go on from one exhibit to another. Now I have seen some of yours. I mean, you put sequins on them too. Yeah, and and that's called it, embellishment. Peter, you can catch this cute one again that you just with the the little cat. It looks like the cat jumping over the moon, not the cow. And some peanuts down there mm -hmm. playing or dancing and everything. You have a lot of different sequins on top of that, right? This is this is called embellishment, and embellishment <laughs> is one of those one of those things one has to be very careful about. Embellishment has to have a purpose. Uh, this is a very celebratory quilt. It may sound ridiculous, but uh, we lost a wonderful cat, and this is really celebrating him. Aww. And everybody is dancing in the so landscape. This is in honor of your of your cat. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful guy. And um, what was his name? Christopher. Christopher. And he's somewhere tap dancing in heaven. So there he's doing a buck and wing. Right. Um, it, it, it ties in a few other themes in, in our lives. We do a lot of gardening. Yeah. And these are a couple of zucchinis dancing. <laughs> There's a sunflower dancing. That sunflower happens to be a ballet dancer because we like the uh, New York City ballet and the emblem of the ballet is there. This is a a wild quilt lady dancing to whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Do most of your quilts have a little story to them? Yes, I mean, there's usually. Are they trying to? I mean, it's either what's a, the story in this one? This one it? probably is a non-story. It's a still life. Yeah, it's it's basically an interpretation of this mm -hmm. piece. But I what call about it the one to your uh, left. This though? one, um, it's not finished. It's it's an explosion. There's no question about that. Uh, very recently, a the uh, Big Bang. Yeah, mm, maybe. Not quite. But uh, someone identified in my work a certain consistency in that there are explosions in in the center of everything, and you'll see that in some of the other work that was uh, shown over at Concordia. This almost looks like a yellow brick road there, or something like that. No, not in this piece. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, another piece that uh, we we uh, did a shot of earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, we're, we're going to be showing that. But um, this is basically something that really comes out full force at you from here. Yeah. Well, that's uh, just amazing. What's the hardest part for you? First, what's the hardest part? And then second, which do you like to do the least? What's the hardest part? The hardest part is um, starting to, to really make commitments to, to, decide, to decide what's in, what's out, where it's going to be. Uh, whether or not it works, especially when you don't have anybody else to talk to about it. Right. And that's why I belong to a lot of quilt mm -hmm. organizations, so we can get criticism so you do and help one another. Mm -hmm. And quilters are very supportive of one another. Well, that's good. And you have a couple of organizations in Westchester County that you belong to? In Westchester and New York City. What, what are the ones in Westchester County? Well, Westchester, it, um, the Embroiderers Guild uh -huh. and the um, Working Artists, um, in the city, I'm going to come the back into the textile. Again, have a seat. Well, um. The um, textile study group of New York, which is a, a group of fiber artists in all disciplines dealing with fiber, from weaving to embroidery and what mm -hmm. what have you, and then one very special organization, which is a national group called the Art Quilt Network, and we meet in Columbus, Ohio. Most of the time. We met in California in October, which was just a wonderful experience. Is Columbus, Ohio the, sort of the beginning of the center of quilt making? In Columbus the... is a wonderful place for quilt making because the state of Ohio is a wonderful mm -hmm. place. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. That's yeah, actually, well, I'm, I'm, you, you should go back and revisit. There's some good things to <laughs> Tell see. Tell us about showing these things. I mean, these things are, must be very difficult to show. Uh, first, you've, you've shown them all over the world, literally, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. you've, in Czechoslovakia, you have and some Japan. of Japan and Japan and mm -hmm. France and everything. Yeah. So um, you, you you get accept. What do you? How do you get accepted? You send juries. In other yeah. words, you whenever you make a, a piece like this, you take a slide of it. Right. Several slides, along with details, and you make copies of them. You keep the originals. The copies get sent out to 
The slides, you never yeah, send your That's original. right, you don't yeah. send your originals, but the, but the slide duplicates yeah. are sent because that's the means by which people evaluate um, quilts. You can just can't send the quilts. Do you justice to this? Do you, do you yes. often regret mm -hmm. that the only way they can see it, to judge it, is by a slide? Uh, well, they project it. Yeah. In, a, in other words, if there's a, a juried show, and entries come in from all over. They come in in the form of slides. The jury mm -hmm. sits down in a dark room with a couple of slide projectors and looks at all the slides that have been submitted. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to have a good slide. Right, that's key. Uh, that's, and the, the better the slide, the better your work is going to look and the better your chances are of getting into the show, if, assuming the work is good right. to begin with. Now, you've had a number of showings. Um, mm -hmm. um, where, where have, in Westchester mm -hmm. County, have you had showings? Um, Concordia College, right here in Bronxville. Right, I had, had a one-woman show mm -hmm. uh, back in 89, 87, I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, other places over at um, Cabrini. I've, I've shown my quilts several times over at the Cabrini home in um, Dobbs Ferry. Mm -hmm. um, New York City? I mean, In New York City, the textile study group has put on a number of group shows, and uh, I've always had a piece in those. Mm -hmm. I had some work at the Mimirinek Artists Guild a couple of years ago. Oh, it goes on. <laughs> you were saying um, there's the... Um, well, the Hastings the Gallery right. in Hastings yeah, several yeah. times. Now, I know uh, one time when I was visiting you up in Vermont, you were saying that you had done a quilt for a college and it was placed in a prominent place in the library? Uh, what, do you well actually I'd done the quilt for myself yeah. uh, and it had been exhibited in Connecticut mm -hmm. at a gallery and the um, somebody from um, uh, University of Connecticut w was very interested in it and wanted it for another show. So it wound up in a show of French and American quilts um, at the University of Connecticut at stores in their library. And they liked the location of this quilt so much, they asked if they could have it on loan for a while. The loan lasted for about seven years. And, <laughs> and this, the idea was they, they might buy it, right. but, they ne but being a state university, they never came mm -hmm. up with the money. Yeah. So I decided I wanted it back. And I had a very nice place to hang it, and they were very gracious about sending it back. Right. So. Is this the one that's a, in your place up in, in Dorset, Vermont? Yes. That's in the, the bedroom. Quilt. It is huge, and I am telling you, it is absolutely, unbelievably gorgeous and original and creative. Um, but now, can you sell very many of these, uh, Randy? Do you have It a, depends. I, I do commission work. Yeah. And that uh, is perhaps 50% of what I sell, mm -hmm. because people have definite ideas about where they want to hang things in their home and what's very personal to them. And I try to personalize uh, things as much as I can. Right, but you, you don't make any to curl up in bed with anymore. I, mean, you're I, just have, I have made a couple of bed quilts as commissions, yeah. but they were basically uh, my own designs. They yeah. weren't traditional designs. And I did have to send the most recent one out for quilting. It was a queen-sized quilt. And I just didn't have the time to sit down and hand quilt it. Oh. It would have taken several months. Yeah. Well, what do you see as your future? I mean, here you have, uh, I'm, and, and again, Peter's going to do a pan of all the ones you've showed at Concordia, or mm -hmm. some of them. But you, these are wonderful, and, and I hope maybe sometime you'll get a chance to see them in real. I'm not so sure the camera can do them justice. But what do you hope to do uh, in the future? More to get more into what the feelings are behind these quilts. There's a lot of emotion that goes into quilt making. There always has been. Mm -hmm. And 19th century quilt quilters have been quoted uh, talking about how they felt as they, they did some of these quilts. Their lives weren't wonderful, they weren't any better than our lives are today in a lot of ways, but they were able to give oral histories, as you're doing oral mm -hmm. histories here, they were able to tell younger generations what was going on in their minds, and nothing's changed in that respect. You were saying you keep a journal. So I that, do keep a journal. Um, uh, when you're doing a quilt, you make notes and, and write your reactions to things. And then This is an example of just a, this is just an ongoing dialogue that I have mm -hmm. with this particular piece. And when I'm working, um, I will come up with an idea that I'm not sure I want to use. So I'll just jot it down. 
and right. then, then some materials I might want to use. I might have to buy something mm -hmm. that I don't have. I'll write that down. And I'll just keep adding to this list. And as I use some of these ideas, then I cross them off. Or as I throw away the ideas and decide I'm not going to use them, I cross them off. Mm -hmm. And then I destroy the, the list mm -hmm. at the end. But in my journal, I do keep a series of entries, um, ag again, about my feelings, about my goals, um, about things that I'm working on. This was a, a doll, and is a doll project that's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, and so there'll be a whole history of you. And there'll be note-taking. Note attached uh, with these. Yeah, so my, have some understand we'll all have some understanding. If you hopefully. ever do a book, will you ever do a book on your quotes? Who knows? Uh, you well, you, you never can tell. Uh, I'm, I don't close the door to anything. Right. Right. But some, uh, some of the notes from lectures, notes from workshops, conferences, they're all in here. And this is obviously an emotional release. Uh, Very uh, many emotional. Of them. That one uh, is interesting. That one, as I explained earlier, really just came from a, a group of fabrics. But it relates to this quilt. And I, Which one? This one. Um, this piece uh, really was the... Um, leftovers of a commission. And the commission had been a delightful experience with a very nice client. And the palette was pretty much established by what, was, what the client wanted. And it was fanciful. It dealt with the moon. It dealt with fairy tales. It dealt with fantasy and animals. And it, it was just such fun and had a good feeling about it. Is that the cow jumping over the moon there? Well, well this, is, this is one of the animals. Uh -huh. And what happened was that the leftovers looked pretty good on the table. So I spilled them out on the table. They looked pretty good. I put them into a plastic bag and took them to a workshop. And the first day of the workshop, I had time to just do what I pleased. And I, in an hour's time, I assembled all of this and then brought it home and didn't fine tune it or start to put the embellishment or in, uh, on it until maybe a month after that first layout. Mm -hmm. And about the time I was starting to do some of the edging and some of the embellishment with um, these beads and buttons and what have you, um, Flight 800 went down. Oh, wow. And it was just scary. And I was reading the newspaper accounts of it. They had seen several explosions in the sky. And I referred to an explosion in the center of that quilt. Well, the explosions are on the outside, and there's a dark center in this. And the dark center, to me, is the mystery of what really happened. As of today, when we're tw uh, taping this, um, Nobody we don't knows. know. Right. There are several theories, yeah. and I've been cutting you out some newspaper in your clippings about too, it. You had had a lot of air experience in one year, oh, of three yeah, airplane yeah, crashes yeah. in your and hometown. You know, so this is... these things all start to come together. They right. start to haunt you after a while. <laughs> right. uh, just, just to finish up on this, I, I think this may be where the souls of those wonderful people mm. are today. I see. Um, in so. the, uh, when I was growing up, uh, I lived next to a farm. And the, uh, the farmer used to burn down a barn whenever he needed insurance money. <laughs> and um, I would come home from school one day and find fire engines in the driveway because they were putting out another barn fire. And I watched some terrible things happen, yeah. horses dying. And it, it, was, it was not nice. No. It was not so. nice. Um, but there was another kind of um, explosion and what have you later on um, when I was in high school. Uh, in, a space, in the space of maybe two months, there were three major airplane crashes in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And they all came out of Newark Airport. They were prop planes. One crashed into a ri dry riverbed just before Christmas, killed everybody aboard. Uh, one crashed into an apartment building just several buildings away from my school. And my school was turned into a makeshift red, uh, mm -hmm. makeshift. Red Cross Center. And the third one was in a school in, in downtown Elizabeth, in a high school. And it was really, really amazing. So, 
And it, I think it led to a lot of air safety measures right. in airports <laughs> all over. <laughs> but we, but I felt that so we were in the level. middle. Of, we, we were in the middle of it. Yeah, and it was this it was just amazing. Something you yeah. can get out in your art. This whole experience that I'm sure. At that time, I had never been in an airplane, yeah. and I must say I was a little bit hesitant right. to go on my first airplane ride a couple of years later. Well, wow. this quilt is um, relates to the one we just talked about. This is the um, really the site where the debris has been coming up from flight 800. Oh, a so dark this is hole in the middle. This mm -hmm. is uh, this is the, the crash site. Mm -hmm. This was what was in the air. Mm -hmm. But this is what the search crews and the Everyone people who are trying, and the people who are putting the pieces of the puzzle together mm -hmm. are doing. And I thought about those people when I was piecing this together because this is my puzzle. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it is amazing, and to have this, um, to be able to, to create it visually what emotionally is happening mm -hmm. is uh, just amazing. Randy, we can't thank you enough for joining us today well, and for letting us come to your studio. Happy to share. I hope all of you have the experience sometime, well, uh, not all of you, but many of you, of actually seeing Randy's studio because it really is quite special, and it, um, I'm sure, makes it exciting to get up every day and come in here and, and take it, uh, begin oh, working. It's, it's um, sad to have to leave it in the evening. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me thank you all for um, joining us, and thank you, Randy, and thank Peter North, our cameraman, and uh, well, it's time to say goodbye and good night. Mm -hmm.